Hi there, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Catherine Prince, the author of Queen of the Mountaineers, The Trailblazing Life of Fanny Bullock Workman. This is her sixth book. She's a reporter for the Times of Israel, a professor at SUNY Purchase, and was a correspondent at the Christian Science Monitor. Thanks so much for, th- thanks so much for being here, Ms. Prince. You're welcome. It's wonderful to be here. Before we start our interview, I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We're going to donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. All right. Put yourself on the side of one of the tallest mountains in the world with bags of equipment, food, and the things you need to stay alive in horrible conditions. Wind, darkness, unseen drops might lurk. Now try it in the 1800s before Columbia made warm jackets or North Face made special equipment with plastic shells, before climbing clips could be made with precision before first aid was industrialized or even fully understood. Now, if you're a man, put yourself in the shoes of a woman. If you're a woman, realize that you are carrying the hopes and dreams of your gender on your back and that you are in competition with another female climber who is battling all the sexism you are and who wants the glory of setting records too, just like you do. That is, in short, the life of Fanny Bullock Workman, who Catherine Prince calls the queen of the mountaineers. Why did we need a book on her, Catherine? I thought we needed a book on her pretty much for what you said during the introduction. I think it was really important to take a look at that time period to see someone who, there were, there were two things. So when she wants to set these records and do what men are doing around her, um, just for this, really for the sake of doing them, for testing them, which is the same reason that men do. So I think we needed to have a look at that, where we can separate out our gender and just look at performances. And I think we need a book at her about her in um, 2021, because women are still working to break various barriers um, and be looked at only for their accomplishments and what they have achieved. And that was really something that Fanny stood for. That was something that she climbed for. And that's the part of the show. That's the, uh, that is the, um, the subtitle of our show is why their books matter right now. And so we're going to explain why this climber from the 1800s matters today. But first take us back to the beginning for her. She's born in 1859 in Massachusetts, so to who is she born? To whom is she born? Who or whom? I have no idea. And what are the roots of her drive to climb? So Fanny is uh, born in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, and her father, her grandfather actually had been founder of the Hazard Gunpowder Company. So he amassed um, you know, a huge fortune. Um, her father was a governor of Massachusetts and had also been involved in um, raising money for abolition. He had spoken out, you know, for that. So she, the, the reason that is important for her is that she's growing up in a house that is, um, by that time period, somewhat progressive. So she was never told that she couldn't go to school, that she couldn't, you know, do what she wanted to do with certain limitations um, because she was a a woman. Um, Her mother was really active in sort of the charity circuit. But the one thing that they do is they send Fanny overseas for finishing school, which was not uncommon for people of her socioeconomic level. So she goes off to Europe. And the one thing I think that her parents did want for her was that she marry. Um, And they were really hoping that she would find a husband when she was in Europe. She does not find a husband. She becomes proficient in German and French. And so she comes home um, and feeling that like, you know, she's back in the States. She's not really interested in marriage, but she ends up meeting Hunter Workman, who also was from Worcester. Um, She is uh, sort of 
kind of quite taken with Hunter Workman. That they this wasn't, you know, a courtship that anyone had foreseen happening. He's 12 years older than she is, and like her, he's kind of ready to just put conventional life aside. And, you know, he was like her shared enthusiasm for outdoors, travel, and sports. So through Fanny's growing up, she had done a lot of hiking and um, climbing around, you know, Massachusetts. And when she's first married, she goes and she does Mount Washington. And that was the, that was the climb that really kind of ignited in her this desire to, to push herself physically. Talk about, if you can, the late 1800s and what society expected of women. You say in the book that life is supposed to be predictable for women. Um, what was she battling as she embarks on her adulthood and potential career in terms of what society's expectations were? Sure. So going back, there's that courtship and marriage. So it is a bit expected that even though her parents were you know, supportive of her education and, you know, supportive of her traveling. There was still an expectation that she was going to marry, she was going to have her children and, you know, settle down and, and call on the neighbors and do some charity work and, and just be sort of a woman of not complete leisure, but certainly not go tracing around the world. Um, and even in Europe, there was a bit of that, you know, they go settle in Europe ultimately, but there's still this expectation. Maybe you don't raise your children, you know, that hands-on approach, you know, you have your nurses and your governesses, but there's still an expectation that you are going to, um, you know, go to the symphony and, and possibly lectures perhaps, um, but you're not going to really go do this physical undertaking that she does and in at that time period there were a lot of articles written by men um talking about you know that too much exertion was not a good thing uh too much exertion maybe wasn't good for your intelligence you know, it could have disastrous ramifications for women so there was a lot of these um articles coming out at the time too so just just, kind of- just, just based on your research um do we know um, how many women expressed either in diaries or to friends or, you know, to anyone in their life um, that these restrictions were difficult for them, were unfair, were not right? So I came across more in some of the articles and some of the work that Fanny was doing where you would see more women taking to not climbs that Fanny is doing, but certainly more, you know, walks and some you know, hiking. Women were getting um, really interested in cycling in this time period. And so that was really interesting to find that that was a bit of a, a way for women to express some independence. They, department stores at that time, they would take away, there's a bit of that in the book, like take away the clothing, take away some of the things on the department floor so that women could go and cycle and practice cycling. So there was a little bit of um, pushing at the boundaries and, and it does start, you know, later come up against the suffrage movement. So this is and sort I was, of seen as, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, how did climbing parallel the efforts that women were making to strive politically? Uh, so at that time period, too, we start to see different um, demonstrations a little bit later in Fanny's climbing career, you know, demonstrations by women for the right to vote. Um, so it's sort of all happening at the same time. Uh, women are getting a bit more vocal. Her rival, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon, Annie Tech, is also very um, vocal for women's rights. So it's kind of all coming together. There were some of these articles that talked about um, what women should wear when they go climbing and, you know, they had to talk with these skirts that had these loops in them so that they could quick hike up their uh, dress to make themselves you know, more, it would be a more practical outfit for them to climb. And that kind of goes into the whole suffrage movement because there's so many things dictating what women should wear, what was acceptable for them to wear. There were women being arrested in, say, Chicago, I think, for example, for, you know, wearing what was called bifurcated garments, which were basically, you know, sort of really baggy pants to be able to go cycling. So all of these things are, are, are coming together. 
what sports are they playing? I mean, are, are there sports in school? Are, I mean, is uh, are there, um, you know, leagues for women, different sports recreationally at least? Um, at the time she's climbing, so I didn't come across doing so much research. That's so definitely not my area of expertise. But um, I know that women are starting. So did, you have the one hand where you have these articles and these physicians um, telling women, you know, too much exercise is not a good thing. But then there are also things being written, one by Candy Bullock Workman, like get out on your bicycle. This is a great way to recover from childbirth, you know. And it's also a great way to have a little independence. So there's a bit of this competing um, fact, you know, factors going on. It's just interesting. It's just interesting for me to hear this because I live with, uh, I'm married to a woman who is a much better athlete than I am and ever would be. Um, she's run like five marathons or something like that. So it's just interesting to hear um, how far we've come, but also how different the expectations were. And I cannot imagine if she had restrictions put on her that way athletically. It's just really you know, a difficult thing for me to think about um, because it must have changed people's lives before without them even knowing it. Um, uh, one thing you say in the book is that the mountain doesn't care what gender you are while you're climbing it. Why did that become the perfect target, a mountain for a feminist like her? I think it represented every challenge she could have thought about. There was the challenge of getting there from their base in Germany to just the logistics. Um, this was a woman who didn't shy away, as you come to know, from any challenge. Then there's the um, the terrain itself, where she would start off. You know, they start off on these expeditions, and it's hot, and it's more of that lowlands. And then she has to go through, you know, everything from the hot, arid conditions to getting colder and frozen. So there's that challenge and then the, the actual climb where she just felt this was a place where yes her guides and the whole crew may be judging her because she's a woman but the the, the act of the climb itself that's between her and the mountain and, and i think that also represented something for her where she could really get away um unlike her long cycling trip where she still you know there were times on cycling which is away from civilization but for the mountain it's really between her and in those rocky faces you say in the book that a country's advancement can be determined by the status it places on women um i just want to ask you women's rights is moving for you um and part of why you chose to write this book i guess right yeah i think um what's really interesting with that quote too is it's so true. I think we can look at our own nation. Um, tomorrow, you know, is wearing in the, the very first uh, female Black Southeast Asian vice president, right? That's, that's something I don't think Fanny could have ever foreseen. I think that what's also really complicated about Fanny is, well, that quote is so true. Um, and while she was working so hard to advance the rights of women, she also very much represented where she wasn't necessarily advocating for the rights of black women in this country and women of color in this country at that time. So it's such a nuanced quote that I think is ever aspirational for us that we can look at in 2021. Um, this is, um, and we're going to get into Fanny a little bit more. We're going to get into the specifics of the career, but I want to ask one more question here. Why should men read this book and which men should read this book? Uh, I think men should read this book if you love any kind of just being tested, right? Testing your limits in any which way. Um, it shouldn't really matter to a male reader if the protagonist or the person the subject is female or male. I think there's that. I think also looking at Hunter, her husband was a feminist in so many ways. He took the back seat to her career. He was supportive. Um, he they were supposed to, you know, do this expedition sharing. One time it's her leading, one time it's his, him leading the expedition. And most often you kind of see him just, well, you can have this one too. Like he really took that supportive role. I think that's an incredible message for young men, for men. In terms of who should read that, I'll just say anybody. <laughs> we hope everybody <laughs> reads it, right? Everyone in the world. Whether you're a feminist or not, you should read this book. If you're not, maybe you'll become one. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, all right. We have to talk about outfits too. Um, I said in the introduction that, that, you know, this is before North Face and Columbia industrialized climbing um, and commercialized it. So uh, let's talk outfits here. These are not clothes made for climbing, at least in today's context. So describe what she would have on and what she would have with her as she would embark on a climb. Well, the first thing, the most notable thing about Fanny Bullock Workman is she climbs in a skirt. So where her rival, Annie Peck, is wearing trousers, Fanny does this. Now, Fanny does this for two reasons. One, she feels like it's my choice to wear what I want, which goes to that heart of feminism, right? It's choice. She also does it because she's very savvy, and she knows that on the mountain, when they take photos of the climbers, you're going to see her right away because she's the one in the skirt. So she does that for both reasons. Now, for the gear, absolutely. She would be <laughs> so much wool. She had this sweater she wore all the time that became her favorite, her valley sweater. It was probably such a ratty thing by the end of her career. Um, so she just had layers of wool, you know, shirt, and then the sweater over that. Underneath the skirt, she kind of did like um, those, um, you know, uh, I'm not going to pronounce this right, hooties. P-U-T-E-E-S. So you I got like, me. Yeah. Yeah. World War One look, you know, kind of like these tights and then like wrapped around and then her boots. And her boots are hobnail boots. Like they've got literal nails like kind of put into them to make, you know, crampons. So she doesn't really have crampons. And then she'd wear that hat that kind of looked like a um pit helmet sort of thing. Um, so she was bulky and she, she's, she's a sturdy woman, but like just kind of just the amount of clothing that they had on and still wasn't really always protective as you read in the book, you know, frostbite. And so well, on. yeah, I, I, you know, I even texted you after I read this part because I was so horrified by what she had gone through. We have to remember that she's not playing tennis or basketball or something else on earth uh, at sea level that would be difficult to play to to do in the in that outfit she is climbing mountains and we're not just talking about hiking up a hill i mean she is climbing mountains um and at one point she has to mash her feet with a hammer to make sure that they were still working so can you just just take us through that moment and how this all happened yeah i mean they're climbing she also you know she had her ice axe i mean she's also they have a guy who does a lot of the step cutting, cutting the steps in the ice, but there are times where she's doing that too. And there are times where it's really slow going, you know, to cut these steps. You know, some of these routes have never been taken before and her feet freeze and they, they she can't feel them and you can't climb if you can't, I mean, I guess, <laughs> but yeah. unless it's really difficult if she doesn't sense anything with her feet and she, she takes the hammer to, you know, first she's doing like windmilling with her arms and kind of that stomping. You know, if you've been ever just a little bit cold, you know what that's like. That's not really working. So she starts hammering on her feet to just try to like bring some blood circulation back into them. And the other thing is she's climbing. She's also getting hot and sweaty. So you've got like this freezing cold and then she's sweaty. This, this is not moisture wicking outfits here. So it's uncomfortable to say the least. Yeah, these are not moisture wicking outfits. I mean, it's hard enough to do this stuff in moisture wicking outfits yeah. with with right. with modern sneakers on and modern climbing boots on. I'm sure, although I would have never climbed and will never climb, and I can promise everybody that. Um, uh, let's talk about some of her climbs. Uh, give us, you know, some top three or explain how high up she made it and and what made you realize that she was uh, that she was um, uh, an extraordinary. Um, climber and athlete. Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell slice, flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. 
Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from the Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Well, I think her first climb of no Mount Washington was actually really remarkable. I mean, anybody, even if you don't climb, um, that's, that's a really tough one, right? That's in the presidential reign in New Hampshire. Um, to this day, it claims lives. The weather can change, you know, on a dime there. So the fact that she just does this with no training and, and she doesn't even have the same equipment that she'll later you know, bring with her um, into the Himalayas. So I actually felt like that was really notable. She um, outpaces Hunter um, to the summit for that and gets there. And, and that's where she really has this awakening of this is the thing I want to do next. You know, we're, we're going to climb. So I would put that one right up there. Um, I think obviously the climb where she reaches the altitude record, the pinnacle peak. Um, they, they do that climb. It's about 22, officially it's about 22,000, um, like six, um, 700. She thought it was 23,000, but later when they go back and measure that a few years later, it's a little bit lower than she thought. I think that climb again, you know, obviously that's like kind of the highlight for, towards the end of her career. And she makes that climb. And again, she outpaces Hunter. So not only is she setting the altitude record, she's doing this um, climb and, you know, gets to the top and and I, what strikes me about that too is she's up there, she takes a look, and it's it's not that you get up to the top and you like really let it sink in for a while. I think that was also really striking to me. It's like a quick turnaround. You know, there's not a lot of time celebrating up on the top of a peak, which for me, who is also a non-climber, you know, that was something kind of eye-opening for me. I kind of thought you get up to the top and you really, you know. <laughs> take it in but I that was incredible to me she's doing that she's in her 50s um, nowadays that's not that would not necessarily be you know people are doing all kinds of you know physical achievements like that in their 50s and their 60s but again we have to remember this is you know early 1900s so doing this in your 50s it's, it's a completely different you know ball of wax and there are no masks. I mean, there, you know, all the modern equipment that we see climbers with just doesn't exist yet. Um, another feature that I just found fascinating of of her life is that she um, is very much uh, a linguist. She she reads, she writes. Part of climbing for her is not just the act of climbing, but of recording all of that. And she's a woman of the world. She go- travels all through, you know, the world to, to find peaks and to go up mountains. So just talk about that part of her character a little bit and how um, that can help us understand who she is. So, so she started traveling um, with Hunter quite early in their marriage. And the first thing she does is they go on these incredibly long uh, cycling trips. So she travels all through Algeria. She travels all through Italy. She travels through uh, what's today, you know, Vietnam and Cambodia. So she she does these incredible, she cycles the entire length of India. And again, just speaking of clothes, I'll just add that in there. She's also cycling in these really heavy wool garments in these subtropical and tropical places. But all the while, she is recording. She does stop to to talk to people along the way. She spends time, for instance, in the ancient Jewish villages in Algeria, she's in Morocco. So she's writing and recording and taking photos. She's a keen photographer as well. So she is documenting everything. And then again, for the climbing through the Himalayas and recording everything. And Hunter also, both of their journals are just details of climbs and observations and altitudes and they're just keeping everything so that they can then write their book to publish for the wider you know public can kind of climb along with Fanny and they they do um through her lifetime what what 
what was the goal of all that? What was, I mean, was it just a matter of leaving a record behind so someone like you could one day put it into a book? Was it to inspire people? What was it? I think her books are um, one to inspire people. She does a lot of public speaking about it. She wants to also show that women can do this. So she's giving these lectures to show that there should be no difference, that women need to be accepted in these different, you know, the Royal Geographic Society, or she becomes the, the first or second woman to speak at the Sorbonne in, in France, that we have a place here. Women have a place in the world of mountain climbing, and American women and Americans have a place in the world of mountain climbing, which was really dominated by the British at that point. So she's doing it for both, and then for the sort of entertainment value for the general public. Um, it's a way for them to um, kind of help finance their climbing. They are independently wealthy, but it is also a way to help, you know, finance what they're doing. I mentioned at the beginning that she has a rival in the world of not just climbing, but in the world of female climbing. Mary Peck um, is her name. And there was a quote that I want to read from page, eh, I wrote down page 207. Um, the quote is, both felt an urgency to test their limits. Both knew that unlike society, mountains made no judgments. They just were. It was only a freshly cut step in the ice or while clambering over scree or striking a granite wall with an ax that these two women truly felt free from the confines of society. So um, who is Mary and what was similar and or different about her sure. from Fanny? Sure. So Annie Tech is born in Rhode Island. Um, she sort of informs her, she goes to high school in Rhode Island and she has brothers and she does a lot of, you know, rough and tumble stuff with them. Her parents, unlike uh, Fanny's parents, I really don't think that she should have any kind of higher education, but she kind of lobbies them and lobbies them until finally, um, you know, she's allowed uh, to go, she goes to Michigan. And so that's where there's a bit of a similarity with Fanny, just like pushing until you, you get what you want. Um, she's not independently wealthy, and unlike Fanny, she is not married, and she doesn't have children. So in terms of rivalry, that was another interesting issue, I think, um, that women being judged for leaving their children, which is what Fanny does quite often, or women not having children, which is what Annie does. So they kind of show two sides of these, you know, um, pressures that women in 2021 still face, all these different choices. Um, Annie is also relentless. She's very single-minded when it comes to climbing. She starts climbing in the States. Then she goes to uh, Greece to do some studying. She climbs there. She comes home. And like Fanny, she also starts writing. She writes um, and does a couple of pieces for Harper's. And she sets her sights so really on South America. And she sets her sights on Huascaran, which is this peak in Peru. And she's determined to get to the peak of that. So the two of them share similarities, I think, more in their single-mindedness for these goals and for the idea of really being judged on their accomplishments and achievements. And we talk about that a lot. They, oh, did they verbalize their, um, I don't want to use the word disgust, but did they verbalize their rivalry to other people? Was there a constant pushing and pulling of who was ahead and who was behind and who had done this and who had done that and who hadn't? That comes a little bit later. So they, they're aware of each other in the sense that I always felt was that they're, they're circling each other. They actually never meet, but they're very aware of, of who is where because newspapers are following them. There's many newspaper articles about the two women. It comes to a head after that pinnacle peak climb for Fanny. Is that right around that same time, Annie claims that she has summited Huascaran, which would then put her higher than Annie. Um, and as any good rival does, Fanny thinks, I'm not so sure. So she sends her own team to triangulate the mountain, get the measurement. It turns out that Annie um, doesn't climb the actually didn't summit it fully. Um, but they're very aware and they're, they are public about it. They, they do talk about the rivalry. Um, they, 
do talk about you know who they think is deserving of the accolades. The one thing they won't do though um, is they don't really disparage each other so much personally. They dance around it a little bit. You know, Annie will make jabs about Fanny's wealth, and Fanny might make jabs that Annie can just kind of go off and do what she wants to do. But but they both kind of tell the press, you know what, this is about the climb. This is about the altitude. This is not about us personally as women, and we're not going to go there. So as much as I think in some ways was this, you know, a um, you know, the, a version of the Tanya Harding, you know, Nancy Kerrigan. Um, not quite, because I think they refrain a little bit from the real personal stuff. They, they do keep it a bit in check. And Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding got pretty personal uh, eventually, yeah. uh, to say yeah. the least. Um, I'm glad it didn't get to that point um, with Fanny and um, with her chief rival. Uh, why do reporters start to report on this rivalry um, and talk about, if you can, this disputed record and controversy that comes up between them? So reporters had already been following the two women um, because they are achieving great heights, literally uh, and figuratively. Uh, so reporters are following them, and then in you know this, this is also kind of a time period where people are doing you know a lot of different these weren't stunts, but this is a kind of a time period too where you had those people, you know, people trying to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel or play tennis on an airplane. So I think there's that bit of novelty here. It's also women doing this. Um, people are still, you know, happy to read about um, Perry and Cook, for example, um, and, and want to read about explorers. But, but again, there's that novelty factor. Um, so they're covering that. And then within the American Al Alpine Club, like that whole world, this is a really big deal. You know, who is going to have the altitude record? And they weigh in and they take, you know, the information from Fanny and they take the information from Annie. And then they determine um, that Annie did not actually reach that altitude. So, so it, it is a big deal in the climbing community. And then you know, to the general public, the New York Times is following this, and they have that headline, you know, Mrs. Workman wins, and, you know, I just thought that was um, really pretty great, like, to see, like, you know, the sort of mainstream media, and, like, you know, really following this. How, how, how many articles did you find during your, during your uh, research? Did you find just mountains of pieces on her, or did you have to um, no, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, or did you have to, um, you know, zero in on the places that were covering her and just find, you know, kind of hold on to the scraps of what you could find? Uh, I did the interest of somewhere in the middle. There was actually, um, depending on her time period and where she was, there was enough, um, there was a good amount of coverage of, of both of them when they were setting off. So, you know, it would be around their climbs or their bigger expeditions. Uh, New York Times, some of the Rhode Island papers, Massachusetts, you know, I'd find a story somewhere from the Midwest, Southwest. So they were covered and then they were also covered in some of the British tests, uh, press. So there was a, a, you know, enough of that to find. And then all the archival, you know, all their papers and all their letters and journals. So we have to talk about the votes, the the sign that says votes for women. Um, this is, in my opinion, the greatest moment of the book, the book, the part of the book that I'll remember, other than the smashing of her ankle with the sledgehammer to make sure that it had feeling in it. Um, this part of the book um, is one that I'll never forget. She gets to the top of a mountain and there is a picture of her with a votes for women sign. It says it right on the sign and she, you know, plants it down. Um, and she insists on a picture being taken of that moment. You know, there's a picture of it. And I think that's just as important as putting, uh, I guess, you know, the, the flag on the moon didn't mean much unless they, someone got a picture of it. Uh, so uh, talk about this votes for women sign and how her career is paralleling the fight for suffrage. Sure. So she's going up. This is around the same time that there's these different international conferences for women's rights. It's not just in the United States and, and the different suffrage parades happening in New York. Um, 
elsewhere in the country. And then you also had the same time period, the aunties they were called, and those were women marching who did not want you know, the women's vote. So she decides on one of these clients to make a very visual statement. She brings up that banner, Votes for Women, and has her, has, you know, that photograph taken so that can also get circulated and get put in um, newspapers. And it's really important for her. She's really, um, you know, she is vocal about that. And her daughter, um, which I think is just important to mention too, her daughter, Rachel, she is bringing up to also be incredibly independent. Rachel actually later gets arrested at a couple demonstrations for, uh, you know, demonstrating for the right for women to vote. So yeah, this is all just kind of coming together. And what year is it? Um, so the, the sign of the vote for women, I want to say 1911 right now. Okay. So even before it happened. Wow. Um, interesting. Um, what's that? Okay. Cause her, she stopped climbing just before world war one. Okay. Yeah. So, so it is before, um, did she have an impact? Did this rivalry and did she have an impact on women climbers um, or women participation in other sports at the time? She definitely, and I think in Annie too, you know, if you give credit as well, had some impact on women, women starting to climb. There's this um, group of um, young women from Vassar College who, you know, a few few years later, like set off to try to replicate, you know, some of their climbs, for example. So you see, um, you know, and in the audiences that they're, they both lecture a lot and a lot of Fanny's lectures, there's a lot of women there climbing. So I think she shows that, you know, she shows that you can do it too. And as she, she will say, you know, you don't have, I'm paraphrasing her, but you know, you don't have to climb Pinnacle Peak, but you could, you know, go for a hike in your backyard, you know, in, in your hometown kind of thing. Like she, she is speaking to that for women, you know, that you, know, you don't have to do what I'm doing, but you certainly can, can test yourself on however, you know, it's good for you. Um, there's a high school that I pass by frequently and I pass by an elementary school and middle school from time to time. And I do see, um, as we all do, uh, legions of young women and girls playing sports. What would she say if she could see that here in 2021? I think, I, I think she would be extremely pleased to see that. I think she'd probably also be really in favor of young women, you know, we've seen it from time to time, who get on the football team um, or, you know, who, who wrestle, you know, who are on a wrestling team. I think for her, it's that, there should be, you know, no barrier to, to your gender. Um, so I think she definitely, I think she would be amazed to see some of the female climbers that we have now, you know, that are just, you know, uh, Arlene Bloom, for example, you know, just these women who are just achieving great heights. I think she'd also be amazed, and this isn't women, but like we just saw the first Nepalese team climb K2. So I think that would all be, you know, And, and yet, and yet today, as an example, the day we're recording this, January 19th, is the day, is uh, uh, we saw earlier today, um, the Mets general manager fired after just a few weeks on the job for sending inappropriate pictures and text messages. And the woman who he sent it to happened to be a reporter. And that reporter is no longer in the business because of what she went through with allegedly, I guess, but with, you know, it seems to be true, at least it's, it appears the Mets have owned up to it and the general manager has owned up to it. But um, she is no longer in the business because of what she went through um, and the torture that these messages put her through. Um, so what would she say if she could see where we are with women's rights right now and also with the Me Too movement? I think she would um, definitely say we have a lot further to go. You know, we, we've made some incredible achievements, um, but she would also, I think, very much identify with what happened there. She talked about being 
shut out of some lectures in the very beginning with the Royal Geographic Society before she finally gets admitted, you know, and, and saying you're doing this because I'm a woman, you know, you don't want me to speak because I'm a woman. So I think I'm sure there is a part of her that would obviously be sad and disappointed angered to see that that things like that are still going on. Um, and that we, you know, we have a long way to go. You know, it's kind of that zigzagging towards progress. I, I think she might be surprised that it's not, you know, far as long uh, along as maybe she would have hoped. These are two fun questions. Um, how good at climbing would she have been if she had today's equipment? Oh, I think that's a great question. I I think she'd probably have set her sights on Everest for sure. She, I think the biggest strength she had, and, and that's, I think, true for any athlete, right, is, is her mindset. So I think with today's equipment, you know, I could see her have done done Everest. Now, would she have done it without oxygen like Melissa Arno? I don't know, but um, I could see her, I could see her do it. For some reason, memorials come up a lot in in on this show. And I've asked this question to a number of authors about George Washington. I've asked this about Grover Cleveland. I've asked this about five boys who were kidnapped um, as free boys and brought to slavery. The question that I want to ask you is, if you could design a memorial to Fanny Workman, what would it look like and where would you put it? Oh, that is a good question. I can't claim to be original because I've used it like five or six yeah, times at this point. Question. I think if I was designing a memorial for her, um, I feel like I'd want her boots, you know, somehow. And, you know, one of her pickaxes um, rather than her. Because I think like, I, I think that and I like a bit of a, that votes for women banner. So somehow you could incorporate those three elements on, you know, a rough piece of, of granite. Um, and where should that be located? Uh, well, her hometown, you know, she was born in Worcester, so it could be in Worcester, where she's from. Um, would it be gonna... at the Would it be at the base of a mountain? Would you want it there? I don't think so. I don't you want it where it people could see it, I guess, right? People could see it, and I think that you know, I think mountains already. There's so much going on with you know, environment and cleanup. I don't think we need to add a memorial of her there, but I think that would be kind of cool. Or if there's ever some kind of, you know, national museum, you know, <laughs> for women or something, it could go there. So maybe a birthplace. Catherine Prince, the author of Queen of the Mountaineers, The Trailblazing Life of Fanny Bullock Workman. Thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Certainly check out that book and also her website, which is katherinejprince.com. She's active on Twitter at Catherine Prince. I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We're going to donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axelbank Reports History and Today. Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axelbank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.